85% of adults say they regularly experience stress with half recognising that they are too stressed. We need to talk about anxiety. This autumn, we'll be looking at some of the different forms of anxiety and the issues that can be on our minds. Jesus had a lot to say about our mental well-being and we believe his gospel is the very best solution to dealing with anxiety. Just to briefly go back to the whole Brexit element, the fact that it's in the news and it's all you ever hear about, that you have your own uncertainty, uncertainties and then the news is just telling you life is uncertain, life is uncertain all the time. I can imagine that just, particularly if you're running your own business, it just weighs upon your mind a lot. Like, have you found that particularly in your job? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it obviously affects everyone, but our company in particular, we build, we buy products from Europe. So mm. all of our products come from Europe. So there's so many factors. So there's the actual housing market itself. And then there's the fact that how are we, are we going to be able to get the products and how much are we going to have to pay? And do we need to now kind of recruit people to do all this kind of customs tax stuff that we have no idea on because we've never had to really worry about it. And um, yeah, and, and it's difficult because, you know, obviously there's lots of people around you who are really for um, leaving and there's lots of people who are, who are up for remaining and there's all this kind of tension of what you say about it and within a company within the company we want to be careful what we say but you know it's uh, yeah it's, it's it's definitely a tough tough time in terms of not really knowing quite what's coming and trying to um, just trying to be smart and think of clever ways to kind of plan as much as you can. Good to be speaking to you. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Joel and uh, we have teaching from the Bible at Emmanuel every week all across our different locations uh, from Shoreham over in the west through Hove, North Hove, South Hove here in central Brighton and uh, over in East Brighton at the marina. Uh, we've been going through a series of messages over this autumn season on anxiety and looking at each week a different uh, manifestation of anxiety, a different cause for anxiety, which uh, certainly seems to be a, a prevailing problem socially. We notice that uh, uh, people's patterns of emotional and mental health seem to be uh, changing and there are some worrying trends. And so we, we know it's appropriate at all times to, uh, to speak as best we can into the, the wider social concerns in a way that might bring help and uh, support and comfort and encouragement. But perhaps more importantly, what people might not realize is just how uh, profoundly and helpfully and uniquely uh, the Bible is able to speak into these very issues. Uh, we, we've come to see ourselves, we who've, who've uh, uh, learned to, to, to love the Lord Jesus Christ, actually, to love him, to have a relationship with him as a person, not just as a set of ideas, uh, we've come to notice that it's, it's actually the very issues of our anxiety, our worry, our, our troubles and uh, concerns that he is particularly able to affect. Uh, the, the change that he brings often happens on this very level. Uh, what's going on inwardly? What are the, the thoughts and the, the troubles that are turning over in our minds? Uh, we found that Jesus makes a huge difference. We believe that's because he's real. We believe that's because he genuinely rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. And we want to keep learning as we go through this series how that can apply uh, to the different uh, areas of anxiety. Obviously with Brexit, uh, the anxiety that people are feeling is on many different levels. Having said that, the, the challenge of Brexit, perhaps the negative associations of Brexit that many of us feel are, are not limited to just the anxiety uh, it seems to arouse, but to various other uh, troubles besides that. We, we notice that Brexit seems to have become a, a, a huge distraction, a huge force of uh, distraction, especially amongst the political classes. We, we, we notice that politicians are having to spend uh, perhaps inordinate amounts of time, uh, inordinate numbers of weeks and, and months even, focused so specifically on this very matter. And that, that's perhaps a, a concern. You know, we might feel, well, this gives them something to do. That might be <laughs> perhaps some of our perspectives. But 
in reality, there is quite a lot that we could be doing. There's quite a lot in this world that might require attention. I, I don't know about you, I, I get more and more bothered by the number of significant things that seem to fall to the lower end of the news bulletins or don't even get mentioned at all that are surely more important and even more urgent uh, in the long run, certainly in the eternal scale, it will matter far more that, for example, right now there are more than a million Muslims in incarceration camps in China, subject to repeated routines of torture and rape, and that will include children. That matters more. It matters more that religious persecution globally is reaching genocidal proportions in some parts of the world. That matters more. And yet this Brexit subject has become the obsession of our society for surely an inappropriate amount of time. That's a distraction. And the second uh, thing that occurs to me is that it certainly limits our... <laughs> if we ever had it, levels of appreciation for and respect for our politicians. I'm sure that this hasn't generally helped in the esteem with which we hold those who hold public office. Uh, I think that can be borne out statistically, it would seem. I know that all kinds of surveys uh, come out, get cooked up, and it's very hard to always know what statistics to rely upon, but I'm fairly reliably informed that surveys have recently come to announce that 70% of the UK population uh, consider politicians to be generally dishonest. 63% consider them to be doing a bad job. That's not a trivial matter. When we are more persuaded than not, that our politicians are not to be trusted, that those who lead us, those who govern, are untrustworthy and incompetent. That says a lot about the toxic levels of disillusionment that are in a society. It cannot go well for us. And then thirdly, besides the issue of anxiety, we have the issue of division. Some of us might have felt division on, on quite a personal level. I know that this has actually got into people's marriages, people's family relationships, certainly friendships. People have lost friends. People have felt excluded because of the way they voted or the sympathies that they held uh, over the issue. It has certainly seemed to generate or at least sort of stimulate a, a sense of divisiveness in the wider society. 9% of people in the UK strongly identify with a political party, only 9%. I suppose maybe generations previously it might have been a higher percentage. But actually 44% strongly identify with their position on Brexit. And so political division has kind of come back, it would seem. And, and the kind of division that we're seeing, where the nation seems to be split almost down the middle, <laughs> and it depends, I suppose, on how you read it, whether we literally see the, the result of the referendum as the, as the way to read the mood of the nation, or if we, we take on some of the, uh, the, the recent surveys that have suggested that well, it may have gone the other way, according to certain polls and so on. Whichever way we read it, we seem to be more or less split half and half. And when a nation is split half and half, the, the, the level of division, the level of competition between the different voices is going to create a bit more rancor. And, uh, and, and certainly it doesn't seem like it's a good basis on which we are able to find easy consensus. And yet it seems that many of the people holding the opportunities to build consensus are instead trying to swing the outcome in, in a more uh, radical and uh, a more extreme, or at least a, a more challenging uh, potential outcome. So divisiveness is clearly an outcome of uh, this season in our national history. But I want to just suggest before I move on that divisiveness or division isn't necessarily caused by Brexit, it seems that Brexit, in fact, may have done more in terms of revealing a division that perhaps has already existed to some level and maybe 
in this sense, Brexit's doing a kind of strange service for us in that it's helping, it's helping us to identify and highlight the wider <laughs> cultural expectations and hopes and desires that are felt. Places like Brighton and Hove, where, where we are here, have generally been identified with the Remain side of the debate. That was the way that the vote uh, uh, showed itself here. And, and generally speaking, Brighton as a city goes the way that a lot of the, the central London uh, parts of the, the, the nation tend to go, identifying with a lot of the, the sympathies and instincts that go with the, the Remain agenda. And a lot of that is to do with even liberal, progressive ideologies and a lot of assumptions that actually are not necessarily held by huge swathes of the national population. But, but we can live here in Brighton and other parts of the country in a slightly ignorant, certainly a kind of sealed off bubble, imagining that everybody thinks the same way. This is the way the nation, this is the way, the way normal people think. And when you don't have genuine contact with people who think otherwise, you're, you're more often than not likely to kind of limit them in your imagination, reduce them to kind of puppets and caricatures, to, to the kind of people that you can easily dismiss as thoughtless people, less civilized, more barbaric people. Because, well, everybody who knows, everybody who's right, thinks the same as, as I do. And the kind of division that's existed in our society is being shown to be a little dangerous. We're not necessarily as good at listening to one another as we might have thought we were. Not necessarily as tolerant and inclusive as we like to imagine we are in the Remain culture of cities like Brighton. The reality is there, there are, obviously, millions of people, millions and millions of people in this country who feel as though society is moving in a direction that they don't identify with. And, and actually in a direction that they feel it harms and doesn't benefit the ordinary culture of their communities, of what they've been used to, sometimes for generations in their local, local context. They're, they're tired of their, their social norms uh, being disregarded and imposed upon by people with more authority, more media clout, more financial kind of grease, more, more ability to, to, to influence and change society than them. They're fed up with being on the end of so much decision making that they don't feel they have any voice in whatsoever. And so Brexit came along or the referendum came along as an opportunity to cry out and say, we're here and we're not completely on the same page. Please don't forget us. The reality is if you only ever ignore that kind of a voice, probably shouldn't be surprised if you kind of drive it to more desperate measures. And perhaps it is no surprise or shouldn't be now, certainly in retrospect, that in the same year that Brexit got voted for, Donald Trump got voted for. There are large swathes of population in this country and in the United States and in many other countries of the world, especially in the West, especially in the kind of modern European and Western context, which feel left behind and feel the only way they can get the attention of who they see as the kind of liberal elites of society is by upsetting them, is by putting someone in the White House that everyone finds a little bit uncomfortable. But at least it reminds them that we're here. At least it helps them to see that, that we need to have a voice, we need to be heard. And that, that kind of challenge, maybe it's helped to wake some of us up. And perhaps that in itself is at least a good thing, potentially. I was really helped in understanding this. I know there are all kinds of articles and ideas and people that will pop up, say, the kind of thing I'm mentioning here. And sometimes, you know, some, some articles and, and uh, pieces are not necessarily so well thought through. But people like David Goodhart, a very smart thinker, who presented a book a few years ago, in fact, in the year of Brexit, called The Road to Somewhere, where he explained using an awful lot of statistical information, the existence of these kind of two different groups of people within the nation, the somewheres and the anywheres. And Brighton and Hove being fairly dominated by the anywheres, uh, people who are generally more likely to be westernized, educated, uh, industrialized, relatively wealthy, 
and democratic, and people who in their perspective, you know, people who are not keen on borders, people who are who, for example, belong to churches that like to plant other churches in cities, just like Brighton, all over the Western world. People a little bit like me, perhaps, need to be more and more aware of the other side of society and need to be able to read and weigh and evaluate the concerns being raised by others. So these are some of the things that Brexit kind of stirs up and stimulates. And I'm here today to tell you whether God is leave or remain. Uh, I'm finally going to give you the word on that. That's my job. Um, so listen up. Now, I have nothing to say of that kind, I'm afraid. And I'm going to do that classic fence-sitting thing that uh, preachers are expected to do at such times. Actually, I, I say that, I, I would just make a little stab here and say anybody, any preacher clergy person who, who imagines that it's their job to become a political commentator needs to be careful they don't leave behind their primary calling, which is to point out to people that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose from the dead. And that is the most important thing. And I, I just hope that you understand that anything I have to say about Brexit, even if I have something mildly intelligent to say about it, which is very unlikely, it will come nowhere near the importance of what this book has to say, which we will get into in just a moment. But let me just say very simply a few things that might help us to evaluate just briefly the way things have gone, uh, or at least the, 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 the different sides uh, from a Christian point of view. How, how do we see, for example, the leaving the EU agenda from a Christian point of view. There's lots to be said for it, surely. Let's not ignore. Let's listen. There's, this is a, uh, uh, a classic kind of uh, list, briefly, of some of the, the concerns that a, a, a Leave voter would, I think, very understandably raise. Concern about the EU taking on the kind of proportions of a, a strong a technocratic empire. Uh, with increasing authority and at the same time holding on to ideological assumptions quite often that are at least slightly at variance with Christian values. That would be certainly at least something to watch out for and something that has raised the concern of some Christians. The fact that, yeah, that those who carry enormous amounts of authority and influence in the European Union are unelected officials. The fact that their influence is being felt by traditional communities who seem to have no voice or say. And the fact that as a trade organization, it will tend to mean, or has tended to mean, that our likelihood of doing trade with wider parts of the world, often more impoverished and needy parts of the world, is diminished. We're less likely to engage in uh, really strong trade links with other countries where we might actually bring, uh, just by, by trading, by, by working more closely, uh, some genuine renewal on a socio-economic level. That's just a very quick summary of a few concerns that Leavers would have had. What about Remainers? What might be a Christian argument for Remain? A Christian argument for Remain would surely at least include the concern for peace. Anyone who knows any history in Western Europe uh, Europe uh, widely, as, uh, as, you know, as, as, as Europe in general, will be concerned about conflict, political, military conflict, and how is it that in the last few decades we've managed, since 1945, to avoid what's been the normal story <laughs> before then in Europe, which has been ongoing war of various kinds, very few lengthy stretches of political peace across borders. And we, no one would claim that the EU has caused peace since 1945. It didn't even exist in 1945. But some could, I think, persuasively argue that it's helped. It's helped to foster context of discussion, cooperation, and so on. What about the likely impact of leaving the European Union, especially uh, on the poor, the economic impact? For those who, at this stage, would be potentially looking at uh, having to change 
their situation employment-wise. There's all, all kinds of economic ramifications which will definitely impact people and probably impact the poor most of all. What about just the perhaps more appropriate attitude that Christians should have? Why, why shouldn't we stay and mend if we see... Uh, situations that seem corrupt and abusive within the way that the European Union operates, isn't it right for us to, to try and remain, to have influence, to see how much change we can bring into the situation? And what about just the freedom and the opportunity for the gospel? <laughs> what about the, the, the ability to travel easily between borders? Doesn't that help if we're trying to reach out to different countries, if we're trying to plant churches in different cities? And so there are all kinds of uh, ways in which a Christian might feel their heart drawn in different directions. I'm saying this to say, I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, the Christian option is to do this. The Christian would vote this way, and no other way is even uh, worth entertaining. You can't really do that. Not so simply. And so we, we, we're in the situation we're in, and it creates anxiety, or it certainly uh, in inflames anxiety across uh, the culture. People's anxious feelings are stirred up by concern about jobs, about the economy, what will happen realistically to our quality of life. Our standard of living is surely going to be affected somehow by this. There's no way this is going to happen and everything to be business as usual forever and ever. Uh, generally speaking, even the most uh, optimistic of levers have acknowledged that there's likely to be significant economic impact. And then there's the, the, the underlying concern about just attitudes, atmosphere, as deportation potentially starts to be an implication, practically for some people, or at least it's kind of in the background. And, and for those of us in this country from European nations as part of the EU, this is no small thing. This is a, an emotional thing. It's worth us, especially of those who belong to Jesus Christ, deliberately wanting to listen, put ourselves in the skin of those individuals in the UK who are feeling this, feeling ever since June 2016, in fact, a sense of forebodance, a sense of am I welcome, a sense of discomfort and a sense of being somewhat out of sync with the overwhelming culture of the society. I don't know if this is my country. I thought it was. I thought I was welcome. I thought I could feel safe. And if you listen to people who, who have seen it from that point of view, you might be surprised at how much of a concern that is for people, how much of a cause of anxiety that is. What about the potential restriction on people, restriction for the young? People looking forward to their life have complained, this is my future, what kind of a world are you leaving to me? But then think about the anxiety felt by the old, certainly the uh, kind of derogatory remarks that are sometimes made, dismissive remarks. Brexit was voted for by people who are dying. A lot of them have died. This isn't really a way to bring healing to society. Uh, to talk in that kind of way, dismissive way, about ageing people. And yet it's happening all the time, surely creating anxiety. What about the potential implications on the relationship of uh, England, Scotland and Wales with Northern Ireland? What about even Scottish independence? Again, further concerns, further causes for potential anxiety. And what about the big issues of just peace in our time, peace between nations? Could that be affected by Brexit? and its impact. This is, uh, this is why I wanted us to look at the psalm I'm going to point you to in this last chunk of this message. We finally get into the Bible. See, on the, the morning after the referendum, uh, June 24th, 2016, I, I remember uh, just scrolling down on various news feeds and noticing what had happened, realizing this is not what I expected, it's not what most people expected, and uh, just trying to organize my thoughts, being fairly agitated, thinking, gosh, this is, this is big, this is rupturous, and trying to feed my soul like I do every morning, going to the Bible every morning, so that I can hear someone else's voice, so that I can get my mind aligned with the eternal one. And the passage that I was reminded of immediately was the one that we're going to just read from now. So let's have these words come up. This is from the Psalms, one of the songs of Israel. 
and it's Psalm 46. Let's have it read. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives away, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word I want to call your attention to immediately is the word though. Uh, it's, it's there from the start of this psalm in a few places. Look at it especially uh, in verse 2 and 3. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. It doesn't say we will not fear because those things won't happen. It says we will not fear though they do. The psalmist is expecting tumult. The psalmist is expecting storms and, and, and earthquakes and fairly dramatic descriptions of change, radical change. Uh, he's talking in terms of mountains falling into the sea. This is kind of what we might call apocalyptic language, but it's not just about natural disasters, though it might apply to such things. It's, it's clear as you read the whole psalm through the target of his talk. The focus of his writing is kingdoms, political changes, transformations on a kind of government level. These are the things that can, at times at least, cause those who cling to the Lord Jesus Christ, cause them concern, cause them to feel like, is anybody in control? And the comfort that we might mistakenly try to offer one another at such times is, is simply to try to suggest that circumstances uh, will we'll, we'll surely right themselves. Everything will be all right. These things won't happen. Bad things won't happen. That's the way to, to stay focused and stay hopeful. It's to remind ourselves that, yeah, this, this, this stuff looks gloomy, but really, really, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. That may be true sometimes. It may be that actually most of the, the kind of scary kind of prognostics of the future aren't to be taken too seriously. It may be that, that Brexit isn't going to have massive impact on us. It might be fairly mild. It might be a kind of a, a blip on the radar. But even so, the way the psalm is written, that's not where we receive comfort from. We're not to simply receive comfort from the, the, the possibility that things will turn out right. In fact, he's suggesting we need to expect difficulty, though these things happen, though these things will indeed happen. Though trouble will come. This is why, for example, in the New Testament, Peter says in, in his first letter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 12, speaking to, to Christians who are undergoing trouble, persecution, he, he says to them, if I'll read the very verse to you to uh, get the wording correct, he says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. As though something strange... Listen, we live in a time of peaking levels of entitlement. We live in a time when we have somehow grown this slightly peculiar level of expectation that my life will go well, it should go well, and if it doesn't go well, I want to find out who's to blame. So someone has cocked it up because I was expecting, in fact, I'm entitled to ease and comfort. I'm expecting things to go nicely for me. And the Christian can bring that quite bizarre sense of entitlement, that false level of expectation into their relationship with God. 
I, I expect that everything will go fine for me. I expect that economically, socially, culturally, my relationships, the formation of opinions, it will be plain sailing. It will be peaceful, peace in our time. That's what I expect. And Peter says, look, if you, if you carry on with that mentality, you will be inappropriately shocked by difficulty. Don't think that way. Or you'll be the kind of person that will react when difficulties come as if something strange is happening. It's not strange. It's actually part of our calling in this world, in this present age we go through, where there is suffering in this fallen world, in this, in this uh, life and this world of trouble, which Jesus was quite explicit about. So the psalmist doesn't encourage us to find comfort in vain hopes. He instead calls us to, I think, extraordinary comfort. This is one of the most comforting passages of the Bible, but the comfort is lodged in something way more substantial. Very simply, it's lodged in the authority of God, the presence of God, and the purpose of God. The authority of God, you see it right there in verse 6, at the end of verse 6, where the psalmist says, He utters his voice, the earth melts. God's authority is shown very simply by him speaking. He's the one that speaks creation into existence. His voice has authority. Let there be light. And the psalmist is saying his voice creates, his voice can decreate, and only his voice can decreate. It's only his voice that brings about the kind of change in society that we might fear or we might long for. Nothing happens outside of the absolute authority of his voice, his word. He is in complete control of every king, every prime minister, every European commission, every white paper, every piece of legislation, every ruling of the Supreme Court, of the High Court, every cabinet discussion, every dialogue between the benches in Parliament. Everything the psalmist wants us to be clear on is subject to the ultimate authority of his voice, which is holding creation together at the most at the most mysterious level that we can't really understand, but a complete level. He's, he's in total control. He is in complete authority. And he comes on to the same thing before he finishes the psalm in verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease. He does it. He brings peace to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the chariots of fire. It's God's doing that social conditions are brought right. It's God's doing that peace comes anywhere. It's God's work. It's God's power. And we can be confident in his sovereign control over everything. Behold the works of the Lord. Look, he's brought desolations on the earth. Bear in mind the way he's won his greatest victory. Bear in mind, understand very carefully, very clearly that this psalm is presenting to us a, a warrior God, if you like, who has final authority in human history, complete control on the battlefield or, or whatever, in the public context, in the, in the political uh, uh, arena. God has control. How has he exerted his control? How has he done it? How has he won his most famous Cosmic victory of all time. Desolation was definitely involved. A, a spear even was involved. God, God doesn't bring destruction on the world from a distance. God doesn't bring even peace on the world from a distance. God doesn't just declare from a place of kind of strange comfort and ethereal disconnectedness in the clouds. God himself Self came. God himself was subject to desolation. God got thoroughly involved in the most brokenness, the most broken way with our pain and difficulty. God got right into the heart of the matter. God went through the darkest of places on the cross in order to win the complete victory that he won. Jesus has conquered all powers. Jesus holds them in his hand. Jesus has authority over every king because he, the king of kings, became nothing. Because he, the king of kings, won through humbling himself, giving up his life, giving up his honor, his dignity, 
everything. And because of his victory, he has authority over all things. Jesus himself said so. All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. We need to see again, if we're worried and anxious about political circumstances of any kind, if we're anxious about the future of our nation, please come back to the certainty that there's somebody who has been through the worst of political oppression, been through the worst of poverty, been through the worst of abuse and hatred, defamation. He's been through the worst of it and he is exalted over it. And he's won. And he invites us to share his heavenly perspective. Come and see. Come and see what I've done. Come, I've won. I've won already. This is, this is done. You can, you can sit with me. Come and get a heavenly perspective. Come and see it from the horizon. I sometimes use the illustration of coming into land in an airport with a, in, in a grey, cloudy climate. But if you, if you had your eyes open a few hours before, you might have seen the same place from a totally different perspective. Above the clouds, clear blue sky, bright sunshine. And God calls us to come to his perspective so often in this book to help us to be free from the anxiety of those who only see everything through the lens of human distraction, human panic. We're not called to that, friends. We're not. We just don't belong to that. We're invited in Scripture time and time again. Come and see how God brings peace. Come and see the way he's done it and come and see the outcome of it. Come and live in the good of it. Be still and know that I'm God. So that's the first thing, his authority. Second thing, his presence. His presence, his very presence. That's how the psalm starts. He is a very present help in trouble. It's even the language of streams and rivers in verse 4. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. If he's talking about Jerusalem, it's mysterious because there isn't really. In Jerusalem, there's not really a big river, maybe a few streams, but he, he's, he's surely describing something more. He's, he's pointing out something in, in the spirit. He's speaking of something not less substantial, more substantial than an actual physical river. See, great cities are often built on great rivers. The cities that have survived, like London and Paris and, and Moscow, and cities that are built on rivers often survive because you can get through a siege. People might come and attack you, but you've got, really got fresh water always available. Always. They can't starve you out. They can't thirst you out. By an imposed drought, you've got a supply. You've got a constant supply, constant supply of refreshment, constant supply of life-giving water coming through the heart of your city. You're so safe when there's a river coming through your city. <laughs> you're no one's victim. You're able to receive fresh life and refreshment. The irony is, like I say, Jerusalem, not that kind of city. One of those cities that actually, <laughs> there are some points in history where it was put under siege. So we're not talking about the physical Jerusalem. We're talking about the spiritual, eternal Jerusalem, the people of God. What river is it that runs through this city? What river is it that runs through the church of Jesus? What river is it that can run through your life? It's the presence of Jesus himself by his Holy Spirit. He said, come to me all who are thirsty. If anyone thirsts, John chapter 7, verse 37, come to me and drink. And out from your inmost being will flow rivers of living water. A Christian is somebody who's found eternal living water. And not only have you found where to get it from, you, you become the one to get it from. You're the person with the well on the inside. You're the one with the spring on the inside. You're the one who, in a society torn apart by selfish concerns and fears and antagonism, and you don't understand my tribe and my problems. You don't understand what it's like to live in this part of the world. You don't understand what it's like for me. The society we're in is increasingly going in that direction where we, we can only hear what, what we want to hear within our kind of little bubble of political identity. We as Christians need to learn to live as those who've been set free from that because a river runs through our lives. I don't, I don't, I'm not so dried up that I, I need desperately to have the respect of that tribe or those people in order to be valid. You can hate me, but I have a river of the love of Jesus running through my life. And I get to be actually able to bring that to other people. 
at a time when a society could be getting torn apart. And who knows, it could get worse in our nation. It could get more divided. It could get more bitter and hostile. What do Christians do? Join in? Join sides and pretend God's on our side? No, we've got a river running through our city. We're free from that. We can be refreshed. We can be agents of refreshment, bringing life and love and mercy and forgiveness to the undeserving because we know we are just as undeserving. If anyone here thinks they deserve the refreshing life of God, the love of God poured out in their life, you don't understand it yet. It's on, it's on the dry hearts of sinners that Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit. And you need to receive, receive with thanks. Receive amazed that he should love you. People that know they've been loved undeservedly. I didn't, I deserve the opposite, but he loved me. If I keep learning to live in the good of that, I'll also learn gradually, slowly maybe, to be an agent of love and healing to a society that desperately needs it. And Britain desperately needs healing. It needs people whose lives have a river running through them. So we're not under siege, or if we are, we're not in too much trouble. <laughs> you might think, well, where's the jobs going to come from? What's going to happen? We cut ourselves off from Europe? I'm anxious. We'll be under siege in a sense. Where's, where's the life going to come from? I invite you to get to know Jesus, see how he leads you. Like, Hundreds of millions all over the world who seem to do life with a certain joy that some of us don't even understand in far more deprived circumstances than we do. Far more challenge, far more limitation. They don't live nice, happy consumer lives, but they live joyful lives in the love of Jesus. Let's catch up with them. If that's one of the effects of Brexit, thank God. If that's one of the impacts is that believers in the UK learn where their true comfort is found. Third thing, purpose. Purpose. Very simple. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Whose side is God on? His side. Reminds me of Joshua chapter 5. Maybe you know the story. This young military commander called by God to, to, to conquer Canaan for the Israelites. He meets Jesus as it happens. With a sword drawn, this, this pre-New Testament Jesus comes to him and Joshua says to him, whose side are you on, us or our enemies? And the reply comes, no. No. What kind of answer is that? It's the kind of answer Jesus always gives. Jesus is not on your side. Sorry. He's not actually on your side. He's not on this side or that side. He's on his side and he enlists us to his cause, to his purpose. He has a purpose. I can't see what it is right now. I can't see what he's doing in our nation. I might try and pretend to. Many people are, Christians even, saying, well, this is what God's doing. I don't know what God's doing, but I know he's doing something great. He always is. His purpose is a good and I want to rise to his banner. I want to rally to him and his purposes. He's going to shake everything. The Bible says, in a little while, I'll shake everything. The heavens and the earth, the sea, the dry land, and all nations will come. I'll, I'll shake everything. I'll shake everything that cannot be shaken. And so the writer to the Hebrews says, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken. That's, that's the way to overcome anxiety. Friends, what's your hope in? Is your hope in the national flag? Is your hope in what it used to be, make Britain great again? Or is your hope in that is the perfect peace that only the European Union can bring? The perfect care and understanding between nations, we're losing it, what's going to happen? What's your hope in? If you're anxious, I suspect it's because you put your hope in something wrong. What should your hope be in? Your hope is in this one, the God of Jacob. A covenant-keeping God is our stronghold. He is our fortress. He has to be. Let's just pray. Father, we ask you for your help in living in the good of your sovereignty, your presence, and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.